Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. It's like coffee with an analyst, but there's no actual coffee. Each episode, we interviewed an expert in the field of law enforcement analysis to share their career-defining stories and to get their insights on the world. Please join us on recognizing and learning from these brilliant minds as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has three decades of law enforcement experience. He led the Chino, California Police Department's crime analysis, crime prevention, career criminal, and serious habitual offenders program. He authored the book, Crime Analysis, From First Report to Final Arrest. He is the owner and executive director of the Apple Group Center for Crime and Intelligence and Analysis Training. By now, you know who I'm talking about, the one and only Steve Gottlieb. Steve, how are we doing? Thank you very much, Jason. We're doing well this morning, and yourself? I am doing great, great. There's so much I want to get into, so I'm just going to cut right into it. Uh, I want to start going back in time and talking about how you first got into crime analysis with the Chino Police Department. Well, that would have been in July of 1982. We had a grant that had been given to us by the Governor's Office of Criminal Justice Planning there in Southern California, and it was designed to target career criminals. It was called the Career Criminal Apprehension Program, otherwise known as the CCAP program. And as the Special Services Bureau commander, I was given the responsibility of developing the grant. And part of that was to develop crime analysis capability for our department. It was a new thing. Uh, There had been something called an ICAP program, the Integrated Criminal Apprehension Program. That was a federal program that had started under Nixon's administration back in 1979. And although it put out a lot of information about what a crime analysis unit should do, there was nothing about how it should be done. So all of us were pretty much on our own to try to develop whatever we could to try to meet this need, basically, which was to try to give our officers more information about crime that was occurring in the community to hopefully then make them more familiar with these things and then be able to put them in the right place at the right time to catch the bad guys. And so as time went on, it was not only myself, but I ended up hiring two other people, two other guys that were analysts. And then from there, we also added support staff and took on more grants. And after the Career Criminal Apprehension Program for the adults, we got another grant called the SHOW Program or Serious Habitual Offender Program that was targeting juveniles. And these were juveniles that probably, for lack of a better term, would have been classified as tomorrow's career criminals, thinking that if we could target them early on in their criminal careers, that hopefully we could prevent them from going on to become adult offenders. And then uh, later on uh, after that, uh, we were also tasked with developing a a community crime resistance or crime prevention program. And even later on uh, after that, uh, I inherited the Bear Drug Program. So We did quite a lot of things, and uh, eventually uh, the unit had grown to 14 people that uh, I was supervising at the time. So in the beginning, what types of analysis did you do for the police officers? Well, pretty much the same type of things that we all do now. Uh, Early on, we were all introduced to the three types of analysis, tactical, strategic, and administrative. And so the uh, tactical crime analysis was being done primarily for the benefit of the patrol officers and investigators. And the uh, strategic was being done uh, for uh, a lot of the administrators, as was the administrative, which is all of the other things that uh, the administrators are asking you to do. Projections of number of calls for service, number of arrests, so on and so forth. If this happens, uh, what is that gonna do to our resources? and uh, those types of things. But pretty much, as I say, everything that we do today involving the three types, tactical, strategic, and administrative, were the things that we were doing then as well. And in terms of prevention with the unit, what, what kind of activities were you getting involved in? But when you're talking about prevention, that kind of brings it more into the realm of crime prevention and community crime resistance. 
And the big role that we had, and I, I continue to preach that today, is to make sure that when your officers are going out and they're giving meetings to whatever community groups or whatever, that they first stop by the crime analysts uh, and get a workup of that area from there. I mean, it, it's called neighborhood watch. Shouldn't you tell the neighbors what to watch? <laughs> I mean, what a concept. And the problem is that, you know, we all have opinions about various things that are going on in various parts of town. But that means that oftentimes, instead of policing by fact, we are uh, policing by perception. And I didn't want that. I want to make sure that whatever my officers were telling people, they were coming from a position of fact. So that was a very, very big thing. You know, let's say that somebody had uh, been doing a program in June. Well, then I'd have them stop by the crime analysis unit and say, okay, let's get the stats from January to June of this year, compare them with January to June of last year, and we can talk about that, and then take a look at that particular neighborhood. You know, if uh, they're going to be doing a meeting tonight in reporting District 25, well, what kind of things have been going on in reporting District 25? Don't talk about the entire city. Don't necessarily talk about the whole beat. Those areas are too large. Talk about their neighborhood. Because most of the time, neighborhood watch uh, officers get very frustrated with the fact that very few people oftentimes show up at these meetings. You know, they're held Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, 7, 7.30 p.m. People are tired. They worked all day. You know, uh, and if all you've got to tell them is the same tired old lock your doors, lock your windows lecture, mm -hmm. they're probably not going to come out. But once they know that you're going to be talking to them about the things that go on in their neighborhood, then they're much more likely to turn out and get that information. So how did you develop the strategies or the data in the beginning for crime analysis? So that, because all of that had to be built from scratch, right? When you're giving, you're developing the data, you're getting the data and you're going from raw data to a nice polished product to give to the officers or command staff or whoever. Well, it certainly was a bit more time consuming back in those days because back in the early eighties, you know, all we had was a desk and a yellow pad. We didn't have near the innovations that we have today. Now, of course, we still had the records management system back then, so we did have access to that information. And we had the actual police reports that the officers had taken. And so what we did is we took a look at the police reports that were coming in each day. And then uh, what we had done is created various logs for the different crimes. And those various logs would have the things like the type of victim that was attacked and point of entry, point of exit, and so on and so forth. And we would keep these logs manually. And then we would try to join together those incidents that seemed to indicate that it was the same person or persons that may have been committing these various crimes. We would put out a daily bulletin every day that listed by beat the various crimes that were occurring. And then as we would do that, taking a look at how they were happening, the MOs that were used, the type of victims that were selected and so on and so forth, then start to put that information together and identify some of these things as various crimes series. And then that information went out to our patrol officers. Uh, back at that time, because you know we still had the uh, RMS system, we had NCIC available to us, uh, we had uh, all of the DMV information available to us. Uh, when we would get some suspect lead information from a detective, then we would start to comb through those leads and take a look through those databases and try to provide those guys with information to better help identify, you know, who these people were, what kind of contacts we had had with them before, and so on and so forth, so that hopefully, you know, again, we could take a look at what they were doing, make the officers uh, more aware of it, and put them in the right place at the right time. So let's get into one of these cases. I'm, I'm looking for your, a badge story. You know, I always talk about, you know, earning your analyst badge, so to speak. Yeah. Is, there a, is there a case that's uh, most memorable to you? There is, but for, for the wrong reasons. Uh, we had a pretty good success rate in terms of uh, our forecasting. And there was one auto theft detective in particular that had been a very, very good customer of ours. And we'd worked for a long time with him. And uh, he was very much a believer in crime analysis and we'd done forecasts and so on and so forth. And uh, he had arrested a fair number of people as a result of that. 
Well, he was promoted to sergeant, and so he uh, had to leave the detective bureau. And another fellow was brought in. He'd been a patrol officer, and so now he was placed in that position as the auto theft detective. And knowing what we had done for the other guy, he asked us if we would assist him too. And of course we said, sure. So anyway, we had a mall in town that uh, we had been losing quite a few cars out of after a while. And so he asked us to come up with a forecast and we did. And I told him, okay, this should probably happen this coming Saturday, sometime between four in the afternoon and 7 p.m. So, you know, I would recommend that you set up and be there between four and seven. This is the kind of vehicle that he's likely to steal and so on and so forth. And uh, that's going to probably put you in the best place at the best time to catch this guy. Well, okay, so uh, here comes Sunday. And, of course, we're off, you know, for the weekend. And I come back on Monday and I see this guy. And I said, so what happened on uh, Saturday? I mean, did you set up for this guy? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we did. And I said, great, uh, what time did you set up? He said, well, between noon and three. I said, between noon and three, this guy was supposed to hit between four and seven. Why were you set up at noon to three? He said, well, because I'd promised my wife I was going to take her out for dinner and a movie, and I needed the overtime. <laughs> 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 so, oops, that, not, not, yeah, not exactly yeah, so did, did the guy uh, rob during that time that you predicted? Fortunately not. No, okay. he didn't. So he didn't. I guess it could have it could have been worse. Like he could have flooded the market, you know, so to speak, flooded the area with uh, the mall and scared them off. Well, that's possible, and those kind of things happen too. There's a uh, another friend of mine who's another analyst, and he explained a situation one time where they had a residential burglar that was working the area, and so he had put out a prediction of the day and time that the guy was likely to strike. And he gave it to the patrol sergeant. And uh, the next day, the sergeant comes back and, you know, kind of tosses the analysis onto the guy's desk and saying, you're all wet. You don't know what in the world you're talking about. And the analyst said, well, what are you talking about? And he says, well, you know, that forecast you gave us last night, I had all of my officers in that area all night. And this guy never hit, never even saw him. <laughs> and you know, the analyst was, well, hello, uh, you had all of your officers in that area last night? Yeah. Well, do you think there's a possibility that the bad guy might have seen you? <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. But that's not altogether bad, you know? Yeah. Just because they don't arrest somebody is not necessarily a failure. Even if you don't arrest him, at least no one was victimized. And fewer victims is also a success. So but, who, who was mean, the analyst? Who was the analyst? Who was the analyst at the time? Yes. Well, the fellow was named Ray Jacobs. And unfortunately, Ray is no longer with us. Ah, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, yes. Let's move on towards the end of your time at Chino Police Department and what really kind of sparked the transition from, from you being in the police department to you developing the Alpha Center and writing the book? Well, when we had that grant, oftentimes the people from the state would come down and do their monitoring visits. And they did that with all of the grantees. They wanted to check on our progress, see what we were doing and so on and so forth. And they seemed to like what uh, we were doing at Chino. And so they had asked me if I would start sharing some of our techniques uh, with other people uh, at some of their conferences. And so I did put together presentations and then as time went on had added to the presentations and it was at one of these conferences that I was approached by a fellow by the name of uh, Dwayne Craig with the Advanced Training Center of the California Department of Justice and he had asked me if I would be willing to present five-day training courses on behalf of the DOJ at uh, various places around the state four times a year and I said, yes, I would be willing to do that. Fortunately, I was working uh, with Jim Anthony, our chief of police, who was very supportive of everything that we were doing. And so he was kind enough to let me uh, run off from time to time to do these trainings. And uh, I was doing them at the time with another fellow by the name of Sheldon Ehrenberg. And uh, Sheldon was a senior consultant with the California Department of Justice primarily uh, in the area of intelligence analysis. Sheldon 
was a superb mathematician, uh, but he'd never worked in the police department. He'd always been in the intelligence field. And so they put me together with him. He was excellent for the math. He taught the math portion of the course, the statistics, while I taught the uh, program information. And so that went on for quite some time. And then finally, he moved on to other things, and I was doing the courses all by myself. Well, at that time, there were no books on crime analysis. And so the state had said that they would give us another grant to write a textbook. And so we did. Shell and I had uh, joined together and written a book called Crime Analysis from Concept to Reality, which uh, the state published uh, in a limited edition to the original grantees of CCAP program. And then later on, when they had uh, run out of the budget to be able to do that, uh, we had taken the book and completely rewritten it, and it became the book that it is today, Crime Analysis from First Report to Final Arrest. Well, as word of that book got out, I got a call from the FBI. And how they really found out about me, I still don't know. <laughs> but they did. And they have their ways. What can we say? Uh, and uh, they said, you know, uh, we here at the FBI through the VICAP program, Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, uh, we are looking to put together a committee to develop a nationwide uh, crime and intelligence analysis course for analysts throughout the country. And this effort was actually being headed up by John Douglas. And that may be a familiar name to a lot of people. John Douglas is probably one of the most well-known profilers that the FBI ever had. He was one of the ones that really popularized it, mm -hmm. uh, along with another fellow that was named uh, Robert Ressler, and they both were very, very active in it. But I think, uh, lack of a better term, John Douglas was pretty much a star in terms of profiling, had been seen on television, so on and so forth. And he was heading the program, and he had asked if I would come out there, and I said, absolutely, along with a guy named Greg Cooper, who was the uh, head of the FBI's VICAP program. And so I did. I came out to uh, Quantico, Virginia at the uh, FBI Academy and was working with them and other, some other people that had come from other agencies throughout the country. And we put together this uh, five-day training curriculum for each course. The courses that we were working on was crime analysis, criminal intelligence analysis, uh, and, and uh, also uh, criminal investigative analysis, which is profiling serial rape and serial homicide suspects. So after the had, committee had put together for the curriculum for that, then they asked me if I would start teaching in the program. And so I was still doing the uh, trainings for the California Department of Justice and now flying back to uh, Quantico, Virginia, to the FBI Academy to be doing uh, the one-week classes there. And that was a very, very nice experience. The FBI director, uh, Lou Free, was there at the time, and so he'd always come in and say hi to the class and so on and so forth. And that kind of spread the name and fame as well. Well, all was going well until 1995. And in 1995, the, city, the state of California was having a really bad time uh, in terms of budgets. Uh, we were in a recession at that time. Uh, there had been a lot of layoffs in various industries. Uh, city of Chino, two years early after that, uh, two years before that, had laid off 10% of the workforce. We had about 300 folks, so that was 30 people. But they didn't touch the police department at that time. So what a lot of cities had done at the time, including Chino, is they had implemented a 6% utility tax. Every time you got your utility bill, whether it was water bill, gas bill, electric bill, cable TV bill, 6% uh, tax had been automatically added onto it, and they had never taken that tax to a vote of the people. Well, somebody in California, because a lot of agencies did that, went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of California said that was unconstitutional, and if you had not taken it to a vote of the people, it was uh, unconstitutional to collect the tax. Well, the next election we were going to be having was the following March. Here we are in November. The following March was going to be the next primary election, which was a presidential election year, and they said, okay, so we'll put it on the ballot at that time. But then they got to study in that and realized if it didn't pass in March, by then they'd be about two and a half million dollars in the hole. So back here in November of 1995, they decided they were going to have another layoff. And the people at City Hall had told them, if you have a layoff and you don't lay off anybody in the police department this time, 
we're all going to walk off the job. And so what happened was my buddy Jim had left. We had another police chief at the time. And uh, we were all told that we were going to have layoffs. And so as it turned out, there were layoffs made, and this time in the police department as well. All of us who were middle managers, which meant myself as the special services manager, uh, records bureau manager, EOC manager, uh, all of us were laid off. Uh, a sergeant was uh, broken down to corporal, corporal to police officer. Two police officers had lost their jobs. A lot of clerical people had lost their job. I mean, it was just a real bloodbath. We were individually called into the office by the chief and told that, uh, you know, we no longer had a job there. And I remember uh, I had gone in on a Wednesday there in November. And I said, well, when is this layoff effective? And the chief said, tomorrow, Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> And I thought, well, my goodness, I wonder who had the uh, odd sense of humor. I mean, if you got to pick a day to lay people off, to pick Thanksgiving, uh, a day that people are going to remember for the rest of their lives. But there we be. Okay, so after 27 years, now I am laid off. Well, what made it particularly bad was that uh, two weeks earlier, I had just closed escrow on a house. I've been a renter for 10 years, paying $700 a month. And now I had a mortgage of $1,700 a month. And the week before the layoff, uh, I had turned in my car. I always had been leasing my cars at that time. My five-year lease had expired, so I turned in my car and I got a new car a week before the layoff. And I remember that my first night in my new house was the day after Thanksgiving, that Friday afternoon. And I remember <laughs> sitting on the couch thinking, well, let's see, new house, new car, no job. <laughs> uh, Houston, we have a problem. Expenses are way up and income is non-existent. You know, what are we going to do? And I thought, well, maybe I can get a job with another police department. I mean, I was hanging in front of uh, police stations with my sign. We'll analyze for food, you know, <laughs> uh, hoping that, uh, well, I mean, you know, you get desperate, you get dead, you get hungry, you start visiting friends at six o'clock, you know, uh, seeing if you can mooch off a of dinner. But anyway, uh, it was very apparent I had to do something. And my first thought was, well, can I get a job with another police department? But then I was thinking, well, a lot of agencies were having the same kind of budget problems that we are, and nobody was really hiring at the time. And then I got to thinking about my seminars. Fortunately, I was in good shape immediately after the layoff because the layoff came on the Thursday. I was home on Friday and Saturday. I had to fly to uh, Florida to do a class. After the FBI, I had received a call from a fellow in Maryland who said that he was crime analyst supervisor. He'd just been uh, promoted to supervisor and he didn't know what he was supposed to do. And he didn't know what his folks were supposed to do, but he checked with the FBI and they told him that I had this course and he asked me if I'd bring it out. And I said, sure. Skip Baylor was his name. A great guy. He was with the uh, Montgomery County Department of Police mm -hmm. uh, at there, out there in Maryland. And uh, he has retired since from there. I believe he's working for another police agency, though. But anyway, uh, Skip called me and he said, would you come out? And I said, yes. And it was the first time that I had ever been asked to go outside of California to do one of these courses under my own banner. And so I named it the Alpha Group Center for Crime Intelligence Analysis. Don't ask me why, because I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I wish I had come up with something perhaps more descriptive, but I didn't. So it's been the Alpha Group ever since. And I went and did that class for Skip, and we had 30 people there. And after that was over, a lot of those people asked, well, can you come out here? I'm in Florida. Can you do it here? Can you do it in Virginia? Can you do it in Kentucky? And that's kind of where that started. So here I am now having been laid off. And I did have on the Saturday right after the layoff, uh, a class that was scheduled for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement out there in Tampa, Florida. And I flew out there and I did that class. So that took care of me for uh, uh, November and December. And then I received a call from a fellow from uh, the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice. And uh, we had been talking about doing a seminar and he just happened to call me serendipitously, and he said, when would be a good time to do the seminar? And I'm thinking to myself, well, now would be just ducky, you know. <laughs> uh, this, was a, this would be a good time. 
So I got him scheduled for uh, January. And then as word had gotten out about my book, whenever I would send out a book to people, I also had a little postcard that said, you know, uh, if you're interested in receiving free training, let us know. So as those cards came in, you know, I would call those people and I would explain, you know, uh, what's this deal about the free training? And I said, well, we'll give you free training seats, you know, just for hosting the program. And I've always made it very easy for people to deal with us. I don't ever require a contract. We always give the people the free seats. I always tell them, and if anything happens, you know, where we just don't get enough students, which very seldom happens, and we have to cancel the class, well, then we just cancel the class. There's no cancellation fee, no penalty fee, no nothing. So it's really a no-risk proposition for an agency to host one of the classes. And so, you know, as things went on, okay, everything was starting to look pretty good. Well, here comes February now, and I had done the last DOJ gig that uh, they had scheduled. And when I came home in February, I had nothing. I had none of my own courses scheduled. I didn't have the DOJ scheduled. So uh, I stayed on the phone all of March, getting back to people who had uh, been sending me cards and so on and so forth. And uh, then by the end of March, I was pretty well set with courses for the rest of the year. And thank the good Lord, uh, I've never made a cold call since. Yeah, so th there's some people now that find themselves in a situ similar situation in that they are laid off. What would you suggest for them? Well, I think that probably what I would suggest is Take a look deep within yourself and find things that you like to do, know how to do, or would want to do. And see if there's any way that you might be able to turn that into some sort of an income or some sort of a service that would be of value to somebody else. I know that in times like this, oftentimes it is very, very difficult. I was very, very fortunate to have started in something that I was able to grow into an entire another business. But, you know, I have found that there's a lot of people that may have some sort of a, of a hobby or perhaps they're volunteering in some. I've got a very good friend of mine who started as a volunteer at a university and then ended up uh, getting hired by those folks uh, as a result of what they saw that he could do uh, as a volunteer. Certainly, you know, uh, believe in yourself. <laughs> One quote that I always liked is, you know, if, if you could believe in Santa Claus for like eight years, you know, you can at least believe in yourself for like five minutes. <laughs> uh, and, and too many people, I mean, we just, for whatever reason, it's always amazed me that we look at other people and we often feel that whatever qualities and attributes they have, they're better than the ones that we have. And as a result, we sometimes dig ourselves into a mental hole and we let our egos kind of go downhill. And, and that's not good. You know, take a look at yourself. Don't ever start doubting yourself, you know. But at the at same time, you know, don't be afraid to take a risk either. That's good advice. That is. Well, uh, actually, with your story, it's a great comeback story for you. I mean, the lowest of the low to, to reinventing yourself to just find a way. Yeah. One of the favorite quotes that I have is, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. Oh, that's and, absolutely true. Yes. And you're a great example of that. And I hope people that are listening to this that might be laid off or whatnot that find you inspirational. Because I just, I, just quickly, I do want to go over some stats since we do like to talk stats here. People that have received the book, Crime Analysis from First Report to Final Arrest, over mm -hmm. 20,000 people have received that book. Correct. Over 500 agencies have had members go through your course. True. We're talking about thousands of courses that have been taught. It's just remarkable what, what you've been able to do. But I really do feel blessed that I have been able to do that. And it's taken me far and wide, you know, to many, many different countries of the world. And, and people do take a look at what we do at the United States in terms of law enforcement. And 
they're anxious to know what are some of the things that we do? What are some of the innovations that we have, that we have? And so I've really, really been blessed, as I say, to have had the opportunity to have those many people from so many different countries attending our classes. Do you, do you have a favorite section in the book or a favorite uh, section of the course? Probably two. The first one, quite honestly, is where we talk in chapter two about the uses of analysis. Uh, and we go into, you know, basically the uh, eight functions of a crime analysis unit. And the reason I like that is because it gives people a really, really good outline of, okay, I'm here. I've just started to work. What do I do? Where do I start? I, I've often told people, you know, not only do we tell people what to do, but most importantly, how to do it. And so that's one of my favorite books uh, or parts of the book. And another favorite part of mine is the forecasting part, you know, and I really, really do encourage people to give it a try. There's an old thing that says, you know, uh, those who don't take chances seldom make advances. Okay. And so, you know, don't, don't keep playing it safe. Every, so many of us, you know, we do our CompStat reports and so on and so forth. And then we go in and we give the chief the percentage of increases and decreases and how many of this and how many of that and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, those poor commanders that are up there, I mean, it can be a situation like, uh, well, commander, were you aware of the fact that uh, you had three more robberies this year than, I mean, this month than you had last month? Yes, sir, I'm very well aware of that. I mean, can you possibly imagine some commander saying, really, I did? Oh, come on, you're kidding, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. They're not going to say that. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm very well aware of that. Well, well, what? Well, what are you doing about it? And Jason, how many rabbits can you pull out of that hat? Uh, well, we're, we're giving that area some extra patrol, put some more officers and detectives on the case. We're trying to squeeze some informants. The problem is that in so many of our CompStat meetings, we keep focusing on what's happened in the past. Percentages increase and decrease, and we had this many, and we had that many. Had, okay. And, and the problem is, you know, you're beating people up for things that happened in the past that they can no longer do anything about. You know, nobody can give you a round trip ticket to the past. So that's why I always encourage our analysts to make these forecasts. I mean, you've been taught how to do these things. Because now when you give those commanders a forecast, now you've given them a proactive tool that they can use to hopefully do something in the future to abate or ameliorate or eliminate the problem. Now, if you give the analysis to the commander and they just throw it in the trash and the guy does hit, well, then they deserve to be hit over the head. But at least, you know, you have given them some sort of a, of a proactive tool. But I know that a lot of analysts are afraid to do that, okay? Because, well, what if I'm wrong? What if the guy doesn't hit? That's why we talk about the tactical, strategic, administrative. A lot of analysts stay in administrative crime analysis because giving the percentages of increase and decrease, even forecasting future numbers of things, that's easy. You don't put yourself on the line by doing that. Yes, you could be wrong. But remember that we always express these things as it, this is the most likely day, date, and time that the criminal is going to strike. It's a recommendation. It's not a guarantee. And also remind your people that there is no forecasting technique that is going to work all the time. None. And the reason for that is because we never forget that we are monitoring the actions of people and not machines. And things are going to happen that are going to screw up a projection. When you, if you try to tell people this is guaranteed, circumstances are going to wondrously conspire to make sure that it doesn't. <laughs> so you give a recommendation, but not a guarantee. And if the guy doesn't hit, well, assuming that your arithmetic is correct when you made the forecast, it just means something beyond your control influenced the result. Maybe the guy was homesick. Maybe he had a flat tire on the way to the job. His wife needed the car. We had a guy that was committing robberies of chicken restaurants from November, well, I guess for a number of months prior to the uh, November, and then all of a sudden they just stopped. And we didn't know where this guy was. You know, there was no evidence he'd been arrested, nothing to indicate he'd been hospitalized, anything, 
they just boom stopped and nobody knew where he was well two months later in january uh he starts again so finally you know they uh, follow this guy's uh trail and they get him and now they're interviewing him and they said okay what about this gap in your pattern between november and january what happened there and he said well back then in november i had talked my girlfriend into getting a second mortgage on her house she got a twenty thousand dollar second mortgage on the house well they now had $20,000, they had the drugs, they had the money, life is good. At the end of two months, you know, no more money, no more drugs, he's gotta go back to work. So, I mean, who, who, how do you work that into the, into the equation? You know, two plus three divided by five, you know, plus second mortgage on a house equals, it happens, things happen. But just because they do, doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong and you shouldn't just stop trying, remember, you know, you're not guaranteeing anything, but it's your best effort to say, you know, these guys are creatures of habit. If this guy has decided that this is how he's going to make his living, why wouldn't he continue to do it until he's arrested? So, you know, I, I do encourage people to do that. Don't, don't just, you know, stay in the safe lane there by doing your percentages of increase and decrease. Put yourself out there once in a while because uh, things that are on the other side of fear can often bring great gratification. Do you think it's easier or harder today to forecast? Well, to be honest with you, Jason, I think it's a little bit of both. In some respects, I think some things about it are easier. For example, uh, with the technology that we have today, and so many people that now have cameras in their homes, they've got the ring systems, to me, that's made taking a look at residential burglaries a lot easier because one of the things that's always been difficult is working with time span crimes. You know, uh, on a residential burglary, you've got somebody that says, well, I left my home on this day, date, and time, and then I got back at this day, date, and time. When did the crime occur? You know, and we've got a variety of ways to analyze that. You know, we've got the aoristic method, and we've got the midpoint analysis method, and so on and so forth. We have all of that, but boy, it certainly makes it a lot easier when you've got something that is going to give you the actual day, date, and time that this thing occurred. So from that standpoint, forecasting the next one, uh, assuming that you think that you are looking at the same individual that makes this crime series, from that standpoint, uh, it's a little easier. I think that uh, the records management systems that we have today make it a little bit easier too, because oftentimes we can get more data more quickly from the systems than we used to be able to get before. But not always. I always ask people, in terms of its data retrieval capability, how many of you have an RMS system that you really like? And very seldom do I see hands go up, even in this day and age. And the other thing about it, uh, on those rare occasions when uh, I do get a few hands, uh, I can't get anybody to give any consensus at all as to what they consider to be a really good system. For example, you know, when we talk about mapping, everybody in the world uses ArcGIS. Everybody agrees that ArcGIS is a pretty good mapping program, okay? Uh, But I can't get any of that in terms of consistency of an RMS system that in terms of its data retrieval capability, you know, I want a male white between 25 and 30 with uh, black hair, and he's got a chipped tooth, and then, uh, you know, he's got some sort of an injury on his left hand, And I don't care where it comes from, whether it comes from a crime report or a suspect arrest report or an FI card, just give it to me. A lot of the people say, no, our system won't do that. So that's a little bit frustrating. There's one thing that I think has really made forecasting harder, and that is the fact that an awful lot of agencies today allow officers to turn reports in late, maybe Mm -hmm. four or five days later. Years ago, it used to be you did not go home until all of your reports were finished and turned in. Uh, Whether it was a simple theft report or whether it was a burglary, certainly all of your arrests and your in custodies, all of those had to be done, but everything had to be done. And if you had to stay overtime to do it, well, then you were paid for the overtime. Today, with a lot of budgets the way that they are, they will allow officers to hang on to a report for sometimes three, four, five days, all right? And that is detrimental to us because by the time you, the analyst, you finally get it, and now you're getting excited and thinking, well, I think we've got a series here, and you put out this forecast, by that time, the guy is probably long gone because you're working with stale information. You know, what also is important to forecasting 
is making sure that you have identified all the crimes in the series that have occurred so far. One case can totally change the forecast. Do you think also think it's harder to identify crimes as in a series? Is it harder to link them all together? It can be. And the reason I say that is because it takes work to do it. Uh, I have not seen yet any system to where I can say to this thing, I have no idea how many crimes have occurred over the last 24, 48, 72 hours. So computer, I want you to identify for me any types of cases that have, and let me set the the, the limits here, two, three, or four uh, MO factors that are the same, and then let me know what those are. <laughs> and I think that the person who comes up with that, I heard somebody said, oh yeah, there is something out there, but I, I haven't heard it, and I haven't heard the name of it. The person who comes up with that is going to make a fortune, I think. Now, yes, I can say, you know, here's an MO factor. Give me all of the others that match it. There's no magic in that. The magic would be in having that thing identify for you whatever crimes meet certain MO factors. So when I say, you know, the, it can be done, but you're going to have to dig for it. Now, what does that mean? That means as an analyst, first of all, don't be afraid to forecast. Number two, get out from behind your desk. If you're saying that this guy is going to be striking in this location, go to that location before you put out your forecast. Make sure that you're not putting your officers in the middle of a vacant field. You know, <laughs> Maybe uh, in terms of uh, the street that you're saying that this guy could hit on, maybe there's no homes on that street. You know, Maybe in that particular area where you're going to place your officers, it's a strip mall. It's a church. It's a school. Take a look at that. Also, uh, get acquainted with your criminals. If I ask you, you know, give me the name of a residential burglar, that's probably not going to be the same guy that if I ask you, give me the name of one of your local auto thieves. Get to know your criminals. Who does what? Who's out of jail? Who's still on parole? Uh, You know, what kind of MOs do they have? Another thing, don't let the math rule the problem. You know, we do talk about setting day, day, time, and location. In our classes, I show the people how you do that with the math, and there have been a lot of successes, and I've had many, many uh, letters to prove it. But again, don't let the math rule the problem. Let's say, you know, a guy says, I left my house on January 1st, and I came back on December 31st. You know, well, what day did the crime occur? Ah, well, midpoint analysis would say July 1st. Come on, the guy's been gone a whole year, and you're going to tell me the day? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, like, get real. Don't let the math rule your problem and don't let it overtake your common sense. Uh, the other thing, don't be afraid to talk to your officers. We say in the classes, and everybody seems to pretty much agree, that the quality of police reports runs the gamut pretty much from pitiful to abysmal. You know, there's a lot of things that the officers just don't put in the reports because we acknowledge cops don't like writing reports. And so a lot of the details, perhaps, that there should have been in the reports are not. But the officers remember that. They know what's going on out there. They're out there 24-7, 365. So let's say that you're looking for something. Maybe there's an odd type of MO that was, has been used in some burglars. I don't know, say eating or drinking on the premises, something like that. That may not be in the reports. But if you go down and briefing one day and say, hey, guys, I got a question for you. Have any of you uh, come across any burglaries lately? where there was any evidence of eating or drinking or smoking or, you know, anything else, uh, you may well find someone who says, oh, yeah, we've had one of those. You know, they may not have put it in a report, but they haven't forgotten about it. All right. Very good. That sounds like really good advice. So what are the tools that you suggest to your students uh, to add to their tool belt, so to speak, is a calculator? (laughs) <laughs> Can you explain to the audience why you suggest a calculator be used? Oh, my goodness, Jason. Jason, you have probably hit on the thing that I'm probably most identified with is that scientific calculator. And yes, why would I ask people to use a calculator when they have a perfectly good computer sitting on the desk? And I'll tell you the reason why. Call me old fashioned, if you will, but I think that people need to know what they're doing Uh, rather than just pushing buttons. Yes, I could say, you know, just put these numbers into an Excel sheet, press this button, and voila. And by the way, let me uh, say now before I go farther, 
that uh, in the classes, yes, I still use the calculator, but uh, I also show people how to do everything that we need to do in Excel. And I even pass out the cheat sheet handout showing them all of the formulas and you know what to do in Excel and so on. And also in our online classes, the online classes are totally Excel based. Uh, there is no calculator that we use for the online. But you know, um, here's the situation that I never want any kind of an analyst to wind up in. Let's say that you do put out a forecast, okay? And it's based upon, you know, the mathematical calculations and statistics that you've used to come up with your forecast day, day, time, and location. So now your officer arrests this guy and your officer's in court. And there he or she is on the witness stand. And the defense attorney is saying to that officer, uh, okay, Officer Jones, uh, how, did, how was it that you came across my client? How did the two of you first meet up? Why were you there in that area? Well, because we have Susie Jones, and Susie is our crime analyst, and she put out a bulletin saying that we'd had these string of burglaries, and that uh, this is the most day, uh, likely day, date, and time that this person is likely to be here, okay? And so that's how I happened to be there, okay? Uh, well, how did Ms. Jones know that, officer? Well, beats the heck out of me. I don't know. I guess you're going to have to have Kirk. And so now they bring the analyst and put the analyst on the stand. Uh, now, the officer told us that you put out this bulletin. Yes, I did. And you said in that bulletin, it's going to be this day, day, time, and location. Yes, I did. Well, how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, uh, wh wh where did that come from? Well, I put the numbers in the computer, and that's what the computer said. Not a very good answer. Uh, do you always trust a computer? Have you ever had a time when, uh, let's say, you transpose numbers? Yeah. You ever accidentally, uh, you know, you, here you go and you add two plus three equals 547 on your calculator? Oh yeah, that's happened. Well, how do you know that uh, the information was right? You know, or get this one, and this has happened. You know, not only do we do things for our own agency members, oftentimes, you know, you get a request from a councilman or from a mayor and they talk to the chief and you know, I know your people are busy, but do you think they could do this, that, or the other? Oh, yeah, sure, Mr. Mayor, you know, I'll have him do that. I'll have her do it. And and you do. Okay, and it goes across the street. And then the mayor calls back and, well, where'd you come up with those numbers? How, how did you get that? Well, I put these numbers in the computer and, you know, I hit the button and that's what the computer said. You have to know, I think, what's going on. Okay. And that's why I like to use the calculator, because it gives you the opportunity to go through the individual steps of how these numbers are generated, okay? Now, once you know what those steps are and you know how those numbers are generated, now you're in a much better position to know what comes out of the computer. Does that look good? Does that look right? And it's not just blindly pushing buttons to come to the result. So that's why I like to do that first. I know that by the time people leave the class, they'll probably never use the calculator again. But at least they've got the basic knowledge of how the statistics work. The calculator. And you know something? The funny thing is, I've, I've never gotten a complaint from the students about using it. Most of the, most of the comments I've received have been from other trainers. So... <laughs> As long as the students like it and, and uh, as long as they understand the reason why we're doing it, uh, it's been okay. Let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about IACA and your impact on the association. And I also want to talk about the, the possibility of way back when it could have been Steve Gottlieb, the radio DJ, or Steve Gottlieb. <laughs> the music teacher. Okay. Uh, you're listening to Alice Talk with Jason Elder. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Mitri Lewis, and I want to say, make friends with your other analysts. Don't just stay in your own little world, in your own little bubble, but hey, meet the other analysts who work in your jurisdiction, who work in your county, who work in the jurisdictions around you. Have lunch. Go play cards together. Do something together to get to know each other. It will benefit you in the long run. 
Hi, this is Carolyn Cassidy, and I'd like to give some information to you. We've all watched shows on TV where someone comes home and there's been a break-in. Their house is disrupted and possibly items have been stolen. Someone gets on the phone and calls 911. Help, please come. I've been robbed. Okay, let's clarify this. You have not been robbed. You have been burgled. A robbery is a person-to-person crime. A burglary is a property crime. If you are not home, when someone comes in and takes something, from you. You have been burgled. There has not been a robbery. Hashtag, you were burgled, not robbed. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking with Steve Gottlieb, who was talking about his uh, journey thus far. I want to segue into your impact on the IACA because you were one of the founding members of the IACA certification program. You've taught or given speeches to many of the IACA events and you currently give out an award at the annual conference called the Steve Gottlieb Alpha Group Center Award for Creativity and Excellence. And I just wanna commend you for giving back to the association And for those that may not be familiar with the award, can you talk a little bit about why you created the award, what the award's for, and any information that someone may want about the award? Sure. Thank you, Jason. You know, the profession has certainly been very, very good to me. And so I really did want to give back something to the profession, particularly to individuals you know, we talk about the profession this and the profession that, and crime analysts do this and crime analysts, but it really is each individual person doing their part that contributes to everything that we have today and the growth of the profession as we know it today. And so it was those people that I wanted to recognize. And so in an effort to give back, that's why I developed this award for creativity and excellence to hopefully encourage people to come up with either some sort of an idea that uh, reduces or eliminates some sort of a crime problem that they may have had in their community, or to come up with something that actually makes their own organization run more effectively and more efficiently. And as I stress in this thing, it does not have to be, in terms of of the idea to uh, reduce or uh, eliminate, it doesn't have to be the greatest thing in the world. It doesn't have to be some new software program that you develop or anything that's particularly difficult or anything, because we're looking for things that hopefully can be replicable. You know, I use an example of a guy who had gangbangers uh, hanging out in his convenience store, and he called the police numerous times, and of course they come and they sweep them out, and then they come back and back and back and back and back and back. And so what the guy did to eliminate the problem entirely is he piped classical music into his store. (laughs) <laughs> found out that people, uh, gangbangers, are not much into Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, and so they took their business elsewhere. Simple, simple. What did it cost? Nothing. I, I'd give the award for that. It doesn't have to be any earth-shattering thing. But, you know, I just want people to think about what kind of things they can do to try to accomplish some of these uh, goals. Well, I've made the award a $2,000 award. So I give away the $2,000 award once a year to uh, a person who has submitted their entry to the IACA, and it's the IACA board, uh, their awards board, that reviews all of these. I do not get involved in the selection process at all because I don't want anybody to think there's any favoritism involved or anything like that. So the award entries are given to the awards board of the IACA. They make the selection, and then at the conference, I make the award. And The other thing I think that makes the award a little bit special is the fact that that $2,000 check that I write, I make that payable to the person themselves to personally thank them for whatever idea it was or innovation that they developed that has helped their their agency or helped to reduce some crime. So if they want to use that $2,000, you know, to go on a vacation, if they want to use it as a down payment on a car, if they want to put a cover on their patio, you know, whatever they want to use it for, that is their money. Uh, I do it not only just for the ICA, but I do that for the uh, California Crime and Intelligence Analysts Association 
because the uh, that that association is my own home uh, association here in California. I, I must tell the people though we were not always known as the California Crime and Intelligence Analyst Association. We were originally known as the uh, California Association of Crime Analysts, but we gave up that name when we recognized that the acronym spelled CACA. <laughs> so uh, yeah, not not good to be a CACA organization. <laughs> well, that's why today we're California Crime and Intelligence. And I just thought I'd throw that in in case people were wondering. Sure. Yes. So if somebody wants to nominate themselves or nominate somebody else for your award, how do they go about doing it? Well, every year the IACA puts out a notice that they are now accepting entries. And when uh, that notice comes out, then any of our members are free to uh, send in that entry. We obviously did not do that now because the entry is given, or I mean, the winner is announced at our annual conferences. And because of the uh, coronavirus, our conference, unfortunately, was canceled this year. So there was no award this year, but hopefully everything will be back in place next year. And then uh, we will be uh, given the award again at next year's conference. But IACA will put out a notice of when they're accepting the entries. Okay. And is that the same with the California Association as well? Yes. Yes. California Association also puts out a notice when they're accepting theirs. Now, the California one, of course, though, that's only for the California analysts. And the IACA is for anybody. In sure. our, in our I, well, they all have to be IACA, IACA members, of course. But the California Association, they have, they have a conference and they too have canceled their conference. Is that correct? That is correct for okay. this year. All right. Now I want to segue into you potentially being a radio disc jockey. Take us back now before you got started as an officer. There was a possibility that you might have a career as a radio DJ. Yes. Uh, and that all started when I was about uh, 14, 15 years old. Uh, I was trying to find a job like most kids. And so at first I started going to grocery stores thinking I could be a bag boy or maybe uh, go to a gas station. And back in those days, you know, they did used to check your oil and wash your windows and that kind of thing. And any place that would hire teenagers already had more than they knew what to do with. And so I thought what I need to do is I need to find a place to go apply where other kids my age probably wouldn't think to go apply. And as it turned out that there was a radio station it was about a 15 minute bike ride from my house. And so I rode down there. When I first walked in, I met the program director, a guy by the name of Lou Emerson. And I told him, you know, I am here and I will do anything. I will wash windows, I will wash your cars, polish your furniture, you know, whatever. I'm just looking for a job. And he said, well, you're gonna have to talk to uh, Mr. Smith. He's the station manager. And I talked to Mr. Smith and he told me, well, nothing today, but uh, come back next week. Well, as it turned out, I went back for a couple of months. Every week uh, on Saturday, I'd go down, and it was still the same thing. Nothing today, come back next week. As an adult today, I knew that the guy just wasn't interested in hiring me, but he just didn't have the gumption to tell me no. <laughs> I go in the following week, and this time I met with Lou. Hi, Lou. How you doing? By now, it's Lou and Steve. Uh, I got bad news for you. I said, oh, no, what's the bad news? He said, Mr. Smith is no longer here. He left. And now we have a new station manager, a guy named Mr. Gray. And I said, oh, Lou, don't tell me I'm going to have to start all over again. And he said, uh, wait here just a second. Let me go see him. So Lou went in, talked to Mr. Gray, and he said, Mr. Gray, we'll see you now. Oh, happy day. So I go in, and he was really, really nice. Clarence O. Gray, otherwise known as Cog. That's what everybody called him. He gave me an interview right there on the spot. You know, where do you go to school? And what kind of activities are you in? What are your grades like? And so on and so forth. And I told him, and he said, okay, you know, I need you to give me a resume. A what? A resume. I had to look the word up later on. <laughs> I didn't know what a resume was. But I figured my English teacher would know. And so uh, when I went back to school... Uh, I went over to her and I said, you know, this is what I'm looking to do. And this man wants a resume. What is it? How do you put it together? And so she showed me, since I was only 14, 15 years old, it wasn't very lengthy at the time, but it did cover the, the uh, subjects I was doing. And I'd been in the band and that was kind of fun too. And, you know, my grades were good. So uh, I presented to him and he said, okay, I'll hire you. 
And my entry into the illustrious world of radio was coming in on Saturday mornings from 10 a.m. until 12 noon, and I was taping up record jackets. You know, back then, everything was on 33 and a third RPM vinyl records, which are making a comeback today. And in the process of being used so often, the disc jockeys is taking it out, putting it in, taking it out, putting it into the sleeve, and eventually the sleeves would uh, come apart, they would tear. And so what my job was, was to take masking tape, go into the record library and tape up the record jackets that were torn at a, a grand total of $1.30 an hour. <laughs> yeah, things, were, things were, were a lot less in terms of pay back then. Well, anyway, as things turned out, I started doing additional things around the station. And uh, long story, a little bit shorter, one of the things that uh, I ended up doing was typing up the uh, station log. I had taught myself how to type. And a station log is a log that keeps track of everything that goes out over the air, news, weather, sports, music, and the whole thing from the time the station signs on to the time it signs off. And so Lou, our program director, he would just, he would have to type this thing up every day, which is rather time consuming for him. So when he found out I could type, he would just take an old log, scratch out what the old stuff was and hand write in what the new one was, and then I would type that up. And so that went on for a while. Well, you know, we were a small station. It was radio station KSGV, which by the way is still in business today, KSGV FM. And uh, as time went on, uh, we had a problem because there was only enough disc jockeys to cover their shifts. And we had only one relief guy, which meant that if somebody wanted to take a vacation and then somebody else got sick, they were kind of in a bad way because we didn't have enough people to cover the thing. They ended up hiring another guy. And unfortunately, this guy turned out to be an alcoholic. He was only there for a couple of weeks. And during a couple of weeks, he'd take several days off because he was quote unquote sick. And so they had to lay him off. Well, uh, well, not lay him off, they fired him. And so now uh, they've got a problem because Easter Sunday is coming up. One guy was already off and another guy was on vacation. And so uh, what are we going to do? Well, the guys had decided earlier on that if we had another person that could cover a shift, then the rest of us could maybe take an additional day off, take a vacation or whatever. And so they encouraged me to go to the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in Los Angeles to get my third class radio operator's license, which you had to have to work at disc jockey, as a disc jockey at that time. So they coached me on uh, what I needed to do and what the law was and so on and so forth. And I go down there and I take the test and I passed. Okay, nice. wonderful. Now, meanwhile, they had also taught me some things about announcing. One of the things that they had said is, you know, imagine that you're going to paint a picture with your voice. You know, you're not going to be a monotone. You're going to rise on some things and then you're going to fall on other things. And you give emphasis to some words and then you use pauses and then perhaps a little softer with other words. So you paint a picture with your voice. All right. I'm there with news and weather and I'm practicing all this stuff in the back room. And so finally, they had told the boss, okay, we got a surprise today. At four o'clock, we're going to have a surprise. And at four o'clock, the guys had prepped me that I was going to do the news. Now, there was a large picture window in front of the control board, and there was a set of drapes that uh, was in front of that window. Those drapes and that window separated the control room from the boss's office. So they hadn't told the boss what was going to happen, but at four o'clock, I sat in a chair. And they opened up those drapes, and then I came on, you know, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Gottlieb here, KSGV News, Weather, and Sports, and I did the broadcast, finishing it up with, uh, you know, our, 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 our call sign and uh, the station break, which was always from the Mission to the Mountains over the entire San Gabriel Valley. This is KSGV, the voice of the Valley Radio 98.3 in West Covina. 73 degrees, and we'll be back with more of the sounds of daybreak right after this message. And nice. Yes. Okay. So that part went fine. And so everybody's getting excited. Steve did a great job. You know, we're going to, and about, no, 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 I'm not putting him on the air. Why? Because he still sounds like a little boy. Oh. For the next uh, couple of few weeks, 
There I am in the back room and I'm trying to make my voice go as low as it possibly can. As I started to say earlier, you know, we had this Easter Sunday coming up and they were really stuck. Okay, they needed somebody. So the, so the boss came to me and he said, you know, uh, we really need somebody for Sunday and uh, it'll be 6 a.m. until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Can you do it? And I said, sure. And so I did. And boy, I tell you, when they told me that I was going to do that, if I had been a puppy, I'd really been wagging my tail like a metronome, you know? So uh, that, was, well, that was the start of it. And then as time went on, uh, we got into the summertime. And so I could work more frequently. And I ended up having my own show from uh, 3 to 6 p.m. every day, Monday through Friday. So I was going to school during the day. And then I'd get out about uh, uh, 2 o'clock and run over to the station and do my show from 3 to 6. What was the name of the show? Oh, just the Steve Gottlieb Show. Okay, very good. Yeah, yeah just Steve Gottlieb Show every day from 3 to 6. And it was it was just so much fun. I enjoyed that. We did contests in the news radio and sports and, you know, call in with the answer to today's question and you win tickets to this, that, or the other. Those are, those were fun days. They were fun days. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to you be, wanting to be a high school band instructor. Yeah. Um, your dream job was to be a high school band teacher. Right. Uh, you've been, you played the piano and trombone most right. of your life. Uh, why did you get into playing the piano and playing the trombone? Well, I got started playing the piano when I was eight years old. And that was pretty much my parents uh, doing. Uh, we had a piano and they thought that since we had it, I should take lessons. And I did. And I enjoyed it. And so, you know, I continued to play. And I still enjoy playing for my own enjoyment today. I was in a five-piece group at one time, and we did one, uh, and, but that's a whole other story in itself. Uh, but the reason that I, I uh, took up the trombone in the fifth grade is because I always liked bands and band music, but I just didn't think it was practical to be pushing a Steinway down the street. So I took up the trombone, played that through high school. Uh, after high school, didn't play it much anymore because I just didn't have you know, another band to belong to at the time. And so the lips are pretty much gone on that, but I still do the piano stuff. But nevertheless, yes, I really enjoyed music and uh, I really enjoyed being in the band. And I decided I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a high school band teacher. But uh, when I started uh, to get into the music program at uh, California State Fullerton, I got so turned off by the faculty. I had never met so many ego-driven people uh, and, and there was just a, a, a general kind of a nastiness, you know, comments that uh, people would make to each other, uh, the, the old bit about uh, raising yourself up by trying to put other people down. I don't know if it was competing egos amongst those people uh, or what it was, um, but it just was not a, a happy time. And so I'd gone back to my band teacher and told him about that. And he said, well, you know, you want to change careers, that's not going to hurt my feelings because band teachers don't get paid that much money. And a lot of times we have to reach in our own pocket for parts, for drums and heads for drums when they break and so on and so forth and fixing instruments and dealing with parents and dealing with principals. And, you know, it's not exactly a picnic. And so at the time I had uh, joined the West Covina Police Department Explorer Post almost by accident. But I really enjoyed being a police explorer. And then uh, when I decided I was going to end the music career, I decided, well, I'm going to go and get my associate's degree in criminal justice. And one thing led to another with the uh, explorer program there. And eventually, I became a uh, police officer with them, police ex cadet first and then police officer. Got my uh, bachelor's degree in criminal justice at Cal State uh, Los Angeles. And then my master's in public administration over at USC. But that's kind of how I ended up going from being a disc jockey to wanting to be a band instructor to ending up being a police officer. But I'm so glad that uh, it happened that way. I mean, it's just amazing sometimes how little incidents and things that happen to you in and of themselves at the time seem rather meaningless. But just like the, the, the lines on the back of a tapestry that seem to go nowhere when you turn it around and you see the big picture, it's amazing sometimes how all of those little situations that happen to you turn around to make one big picture. And for me, it turned out to be career in law enforcement with an emphasis in crime analysis. Well, our last segment is words to the world. I give the guests the last word. So Steve, what are your words to the world? 
I think my world, words to the world are probably best prefaced by Maya Angelou's words. And she said something that I, I've always loved. She said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And with that in, the, in mind, my words to the world are, make someone feel good about themselves today. Very good. Well, Steve, I leave everybody with, you've given me just enough to talk bad about you later. Great. And, but I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for being on the program and you be safe. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk with you and uh, best wishes for much success to everybody. Thank you for joining us today on Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. We hope you not only enjoyed the show, but also learned something new. For more information on our guests and information relating to today's topic, please visit our website at leapodcast.com. Special thanks to the Rough and Tumble for our theme song. For more of their music, you can visit their website at theroughandtumble.com. Also, thanks to Kyle McMullen for our show logo. For more of his design, please visit his website at moderntype.com. The show is hosted, recorded, and edited by Jason Elder and written by me, Mindy. You can contact us both via the LEA podcast website. Please join us again next time as we interview another expert in this great field.